very happy to be here. This is a beautiful conference. And uh, I had another plan for this conference initially, another talk. But then uh, uh, I was supposed to give this talk to the Miami conference, but there was some negotiation. And part of the negotiation was that together with my talk about uh, this, uh, I was supposed to take part uh, at this panel. And so I said, uh, I mean, uh, kudos to Shinobi that had the stomach, but I didn't. But now let's, let's not talk about people anymore. You know, small minds talk about people, big, great minds talk about ideas. So let's forget all this. You really believe me? <laughs> You're going to be so disappointed. <laughs> okay, but, but that, I was convincing. That, that's funny. Okay, so uh, the, the title of the talk also, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very self-explanatory, but I will try to make some points and answer some questions. The first question is, uh, have ordinals uh, broken Bitcoin? And uh, this is something that somebody is saying, uh, should, be, should we freak out? Should we be scared? Is this like a new, uh, you inedit attack vector that we never know about? Uh, the second question is, uh, have ordinals been enabled by Taproot? Was Taproot a mistake? Because uh, these guys, but let's not talk about people, these are like called the Taproot wizard. So maybe or Taproot was a mistake. Was it Taproot to create this, this situation? Uh, and uh, are ordinals and inscriptions the same? Because most people now talk about ordinals, but actually what they mean is inscriptions. And uh, I will make a case that they are both useless terms, but let's try to clarify the difference. Are uh, ordinals useful for censorship resistance? I, I discussed it with one guy that told me that uh, ordinals will be great uh, to like uh, send uh, 3D printed gun projects to the third world to fight tyranny. I mean, is this true or is this retarded? And I, I, I don't want to spoiler you the result yet. Uh, are ordinals, uh, this, is very, this is a very important point, are they new and innovative? Is there any novelty in ordinals at all? And are ordinals retarded? Uh, spoiler alert, the answer to everything is no, except for the last point, which is yes. Thank you, bye. Uh, now, I will, try to, I will try to make an argument for that. Uh, let's take the, the, the meaning first. So the, a very, uh, the, the, the meaning that you are all assuming right now is the colloquial derogatory meaning that means extremely stupid. Uh, it is politically incorrect, so to be avoided generally uh, in the present day United States cultural context. But well, hey, we are in Czech Republic, so we don't care. So I can make a so I can make a very quick case for this, uh, for this meaning. Uh, uh, so the next part of my presentation will try to argue that ordinals are extremely stupid. Okay, and I'm done. This is the end of this part of the presentation. I, I think you, now again, uh, you know, small minds, great minds. Let's, let's stop talking about these guys. So there is another meaning of retarded, which is also actually it's, uh, it's, it's even higher, which is delayed like delayed in development, uh, this kind of plant is usually of retarded growth. And I will make a case uh, that ordinals are especially retarded in this sense. Well, most of the other, but especially in this sense. Like we are discussing stuff that was already proposed, discussed, debated, and put to sleep in 2012 and 2013. And this is just coming all over again, mostly for this phenomenon here. This is a slide from the great presentation by Conshure. I, I'm t I always uh, quote Conshure in every presentation, so uh, uh, sorry, guy. But it was very, it was very good at uh, Baltic on a Badger. And uh, Eternal September is that phenomenon of, of the internet in which uh, you still have noobs coming in. They, they completely ignore the history of what came before. They, it's al always uh, everything is new for them. They don't know their history. And uh, Coinsure himself uh, basically uh, summarized this, uh, this uh, phenomenon very recently in, on Twitter. The sure way to become the hot new thing in Bitcoin is to take a failed business idea or technical proposal that is five years old, repackage it, and bask in the admiration of a generation of noobs who exclaim, why didn't anyone think of this before? In this case, we are not talking about five years, but basically 11 years. So this, this was an operation that was even more ambitious. So let's go back, uh, let's, let's take a trip to memory lane. 
And let's go back to, uh, to try to explain two concepts that were highly debated back in the times. The first concept is the concept of uh, sat coloring, satoshi coloring, or coin coloring. So the idea is that you can, uh, so right now, the way Bitcoin works, uh, uh, some satoshis enter uh, a transaction, some other satoshis exit, but there is no deterministic correlation. There is no way to know in principle if one is the payment, one is the change, and one is getting back, one is getting there. It's just like uh, there is a village where there is a foundry and people are bringing in uh, UTXO that are basically gold bullions or different sizes. They bring it in, they melt it, and then they bring it out. Somebody on a tower can watch some people getting in and out, and they can make up an arbitrary scheme to say that this gold atom was the same of that gold atom. But this is completely made up. The guy on the tower will completely miss anything which is happening inside the room, or it will also miss other entrances. So the, it will just have to make up something. An idea is just to create an arbitrary scheme that says that this Satoshi entering here is the same as this. You can do it first in, first out, first in, last out, first in, middle out. There are, there are infinite ways to do it. None of these ways have any particular specific technical meaning, and they're all made up, and they will lose a lot of information about lightning routing, UTXO sharing, coin join, pay join. So it's basically all made up. What was the original idea? Why to do something like this? The idea was basically to do the, the use cases where possibly the representation on Bitcoin on other digital rights like shares, IOUs, uh, fidelity points, uh, governance roles. There were also some people trying to push some more evil idea like uh, tracking in order to blacklist the criminal money. So tainting some Satoshis in a way that they are connected to some crime so nobody is able to use them anymore. Breaking fungibility to track people, to denonymize people and to use uh, monetary engineering to censor crime or what is a, whatever is crime you know that everybody's a criminal like every action you took uh, since this morning to now is illegal in some jurisdictions so we're all criminals so uh, this idea started actually in 2012 there was the very first uh, uh, article about that in uh, march 2012 and there is a white paper uh, the, the main guy is, is Yoni, but there were, there were two interesting names in this uh, paper. One is uh, Vitalik Buterin. Actually, uh, uh, Ethereum uh, started also from an attempt to make color a coin better, and now we know how it ended, but the attempt was that. And the other is a like, company called Kolu, which is interesting in the story, because one uh, young employee of Kolu was this guy here. But let's not talk about people. I mean, we are great minds. Let's get back to ideas. So uh, they, what, there was a presentation by Alex Mitsraki, Killer Storm, and a white paper by many. Uh, the idea was, uh, was, was it very interesting, very well received, no prejudicial opposition. Everybody was considering it, and everybody started to debate it at length. There, was many, there were many variations on this, this idea. Some were more complex, like some were just uh, uh, coloring specific UTXO with some action, like an op return, but some were just uh, new, uh, basically denumeration of Satoshis. So you can see this post, which is from uh, October 2012 by J2H12, uh, uh, or some, uh, I don't know the guy, I'm sorry. Uh, but he proposed the idea to give a number to every Satoshi from start to finish. And that was exactly what ordinals are. There is no, literally no difference. The only difference is the notation that they came up with, uh, which is the, it's a nice like uh, uh, co polar coordinate notation, but that's literally the only difference. So this idea was presented, and if you, if you go back to search for this uh, forum post, it's, it's, fine, it's fun because just after this, there is Jeff Garzik, uh, that was uh, the, the Bitcoin developer, which was basically answering to this guy, well, you know, this is October 2012. This idea was already, uh, was already discussed in September 2012. You are late. I mean, stop discussing something that we already put to sleep one month ago. And this was 2012. And this was exactly the same scheme. Uh, of course, uh, not everybody was, uh, was thinking about the interesting use cases. There were some people, including this, uh, this basically coin validation startup or a patent by a IBM that uh, around 2013 started to uh, propose stuff. Mike Hearn was also involved in uh, some capacity to basically 
using coin tracking or coin tainting or sat coloring in order to stop the bad guys and to break fungibility and to reduce privacy. So there was a lot of pushback uh, about these uh, in the community. Uh, there was a, uh, th this, uh, this proposal didn't even stop uh, in 2012 uh, and 2013. For example, our friend Luca Venturini, former coin developer, uh, he was working with us at a, at, a at a protocol called Token21. It was 2017, and the idea was let's do color coins again, but this, tries, th th this, ti this time around let's do it in a way that preserves privacy and fungibility, it doesn't break fungibility. So this was a, an attempt at doing color coins but with plausible deniability, so that nobody can say for sure that you are using the protocol, if not the receiver. So it was, it was very interesting. Uh, what are basically the problems? The first one is that it can be used for evil purposes. It can be used for, for surveillance and censorship. It only works with low fungibility practices. So the assumption is that whoever is using colored coins must not be using something like uh, lightning network routing or something like that, because otherwise the schemes, they, they break. So using the scheme is a disincentive to use uh, uh, any kind of fungibility practice. Of course, uh, one could object that it's, it, it, it is opt-in. If, if you want to have lesser privacy, you use it, otherwise you don't use it. But actually, they create uh, new anti-fungibility heuristics. So if some uh, chain anal company is looking at a, bl at a block in a transaction, they will assume heuristics like uh, change heuristic, common input ownership. They can also assume uh, color coin heuristics on top, uh, so they don't just ruin your fungibility, but also fungibility of other people, in a way at least. Uh, they introduce weird incentive for miners, what shitcoiners now call MEV, but it was already discussed by serious bitcoiners back then. So the idea is that if you have uh, a, a Satoshi, which is basically representative of an Apple share, and you have the Apple market cap re represented on Bitcoin, now miners will have strange incentives to maybe not include transactions. So you overcomplicate the mining gain. The mining game is easy, it's just an auction. If you introduce uh, external value, you can try to censor a, maybe a, um, an equity swap or something. So we already know how this bullshit works, basically, because uh, other people did it for us. Uh, uh, of course, it cannot work with SPV style light clients because the miners, they are supposed to actually enforce Bitcoin rules, but they are not supposed, uh, supposed to enforce color coin rules or meta protocol rules. So you cannot, e no, you cannot e easily rely on SPV. Uh, and also you are capped in maximum supplies. You have 2.1 peta sets, uh, so quadrillion of sets. That seems like a lot. But if everybody uses that for, uh, for uh, blue chip uh, stocks uh, and for private debt, uh, it will run out pretty, pretty fast. So, uh, so 2.1 peta sats, uh, 21 million, it's enough for money. It's more than enough for money in the next centuries, probably. But it's not enough for any kind of other asset. So these were the problem. And also, the fundamental problem was that most issued assets will require centralization anyway. So if you have credit, you will require a company that will basically recognize that knowledge and, and refund that credit. So there is centralization, so why not to use MySQL, right? That was the, always the argument. Uh, the solution came uh, basically in a, in a progression from very simple color coin schemes to more flexible color coin schemes that maybe they were not using the number of Satoshis, but just the, the generic UTXO, uh, giving information about the number in other ways. So more flexibility. Then people started to switch to meta protocols. So you just write on op return something that the coin, uh, the, uh, the counterparty protocol or, or the Omni protocol will interpret as something else. So there was a progression. And the end of the progression, according to many people that worked with us back then in 2013, 2014, was to just remove this stuff from the blockchain use the blockchain, the time chain, only as an anti-double spending device. So the time chain only does, does one work, which is preventing double spending. Use that and everything else, the proof of uh, ownership, the signature, everything goes off-chain, peer-to-peer directly, which is what RGB is and some other copycats of RGB also are. Uh, and that was the basically, I, I think that among my friends, it was basically uh, univocal consensus that this was the way to go. I mean, we, sp we were talking with a lot of people. I presented uh, RGB in uh, 2018, I think, in uh, Lisbon as an idea. And everybody was telling me, yeah, if we really want assets, this is the way to go. Maybe liquid assets, maybe not these, but we have to move assets off chain. There was just one friend of mine uh, that was really not convinced uh, because, uh, y yes, you can fix all these problems except for the last one. So this friend was saying, okay, like RGB cannot be used for, for tracking because everything is off chain. 
uh, it, it does incentivize fungibility practices and it does reduces anti-fungibility heuristics. So RGB increases the privacy of everybody because now you don't know if a payment is just a Satoshi payment or there are hidden asset payments. It cannot introduce MEV because miners don't know what they are mining. Uh, it can work with SPV style -like clients because you have a local history. You don't have a cap of maximum supply, so it's great, except for the last problem. This is all useless. So this friend of mine uh, tweeted to me that this was all for nothing because anyway you will use just a centralized database and, and this is all for nothing. So this friend of mine was this guy again, but let's talk talking about people because we are great minds and we want to talk only about ideas. So let's back to the discussion. Mostly all the industry recognized that this colored uh, coin idea was flawed and so it was abandoned. Colu, Chromaway, CoinSpark became a private blockchain uh, consulting enterprise. So they were basically overcharging for database uh, uh, dump clients, which is fine. And uh, some others like CoinPrism that just died, which is also fine because if, it, if the business doesn't make any sense, you just die. Um, so let's move from set coloring to another historic thing, which was initially completely unrelated. This is data encoding in the time chain. So the idea is that you can basically use permanent fields in Bitcoin, transactions or blocks, in order to, mostly transaction, in order to encode non-transactional data that can po be possibly read by others if the encoding format is made public. So your Bitcoin node will never read anything which is not a Bitcoin transaction. Your Bitcoin node can only read Bitcoin transaction. But if you take some data and you pretend it's a Bitcoin output or script or whatever, and uh, then there, there may be some special software that can actually decode it. Maybe you are just writing down in the hexadecimal. The initiator of this practice actually was a kind of a good guy, was a guy that I kind of respect. Uh, it was basically, uh, well, well, let's first talk about use cases. What are possible use cases? First, preserving information that you want to last forever. I, everybody will have to replicate the blockchain forever. So I write something on the blockchain, so you will have to replicate forever. So I can keep this information forever. Total data reliability. The second would be trolling and spamming. You are trying to, to run a Bitcoin node, I will try to troll you with some unrelated data. Uh, the first guy to try something like this was a, a guy called Satoshi Nakamoto. I mean, he's a good guy all around. Uh, he did it in a field that was already uh, like the Coinbase already acts as uh, a field that you have to fill with garbage anyway because you need extra entropy for the nonce. So it didn't consume any extra data, data band. He just had to write something and he decided to inscript uh, this, uh, this famous, very famous uh, uh, title from the Times. Which this page is also very funny because uh, it's also a proof of inflation of you know, fiat money because you cannot eat it out in London for five pounds anymore. So it's also a very interesting uh, like explanation of fiat money. So very important, very important page. Uh, but then uh, immediately Gavin Andreessen um, he, he said, okay, but that's a good feature until it gets popular and somebody decides it will be fun to flood the payment network with millions of transactions to transfer the latest Lady Gaga video uh, to all their friends. So Lady Gaga was already a thing in, in June 2010. I, I, I was surprised. Well, at least for Gavin, he was an early fan. And uh, so uh, Satoshi answers, that's one of the reasons tra for transactions fees, but there are other things we can do if necessary. So Satoshi recognized that this is not a great thing for Bitcoin, that fees are preventing this somehow, that fees may not be enough, and the other things can be done on top to prevent this kind of abuse of the, of the time chain. Uh, people mostly started to use it for innocent stuff. This is, um, this is basically Len Sasama, the developer that died. So his friend basically created his face with, uh, uh, with uh, ASCII characters, and they also put their Ben Bernanke, because why not? Uh, it, was, it was the Fed guy back then. So it was a very innocent thing that everybody enjoyed. Uh, then some, some guys started to go a little bit more aggressive. So for example, in 2013, uh, this guy paid uh, 800,000 sets to put the never gonna give you up lyrics in an up return. Uh, it's interesting because this guy could have not done that in a standard transaction. You have to know that in Bitcoin, there are two kinds of policies. One is validity. So you will check a block and you will check if the block is valid and if all the transactions are valid. And this was valid. But when you run a node, you will also check all the unconfirmed transactions and you will check if they are standard. 
If they are standard, you broadcast them until some miners will mine them. If they are not, you delete them. This transaction was not standard because uh, the standardness policies, they include a lot of anti-spam filters. For example, if you send uh, a transaction that boosts one Satoshi, you, the nodes, my node, your node, everybody's node will say, this is not worth it. The amount of data it is consuming in, in the network is more than the, than the economic significance of that one Satoshi. So this is just spam, let's delete it. Uh, because uh, it, the fees are a great mechanism to prevent something to go into the time chain, but not to prevent to some something to, to go in your own node. So this was not a standard transaction, so the guy had to basically do it non-standard and pay it to a mining, mining pool directly. Uh, you may say, okay, but this was all done by technical people. W there was not an easy way back then to do this stuff. Actually, our friend Ricardo Casatta, where w that was working with, um, with us in Milan, he created an old website. It was called Eternity Wall. The story is very, f is very fun. Jack, uh, Jack Muller's mom, Bitcoin, Bitcoin mom, she, she boosted on Twitter that uh, he, uh, her husband uh, dedicated to her a love sentence that will stay in Bitcoin forever. Ricardo said, sorry, this is just a not a field of blockchain info. This is not forever. I will create a website that allows you to write it in the blockchain forever. This website was great. You could, uh, you have a mnemonic, a mobile app. Everybody could use it, even your grandma. You, you just get a mnemonic, you can write stuff, you can answer to stuff, you can zap people, just like a author, but on chain. Uh, the problem uh, with this idea is that uh, first uh, it can be used, uh, used for evil purposes like uh, spam or defacing. Uh, it, it does compete with transactional data in the time chain. So if people are trying to use Bitcoin for what Bitcoin was created for, this either innocent or evil attempt uh, will uh, eventually co outprice them or can uh, compete with them. Uh, it's doomed to be expensive and inefficient. Uh, uh, it does, so this method of writing does pay for the miners, but it doesn't pay the nodes. So the miners will be paid to, to, to download and, and uh, use this stuff, but the nodes will not be paid. They will have to download, validate, and broadcast for free. So they are subject to a complete free riding. It introduces additional protects for Bitcoin bans. You can, you can basically wrote, write uh, uh, Islamic uh, blasphemy or, uh, or, or child pornography, whatever you want, if you, if you pay enough. And that can create additional attack surface for Bitcoin. Of course, Bitcoin was created to not care, but still having more than one laws to get after your node is worse than to have just one. If you just break financial law, that's better than to break other laws. And, uh, and it cannot scale for any meaningful use. Like uh, you have basically, uh, back then, Ricardo had uh, 53 gigabytes per year. That was all he had. Uh, 53 gigabytes on Twitter, they are a few seconds. So not even for text, it, it doesn't scale. It only scales if, a very, like if you, you or your friends use it for a while. But then uh, whenever you want to have a meaningful uh, adoption, this cannot scale. Uh, and then there are other solutions that are already cover more, uh, uh, more practical cases. Onion servers, uh, Tor, uh, now we have Nostra, we have Freenet, we have a lot of other the, a censorship resistant solutions. The possible solution was to go from non-prunable, so at the beginning this, uh, this, is this, this stuff uh, used uh, like uh, UTXO's non-prunable, then to prunable, like uh, the signature, then to single ashes that will just refer to, uh, to the data, to stuff with like open test stamps by Ricardo and Peter Todd and other people that is very scalable and can scale very nicely. So uh, except for the last problem, you probably still don't need it. I mean, you can open test stamps. So Ricardo and Peter open test stamp the whole internet archive in one day with one transaction. The problem is that you can do it on Twitter or on Passbean as well. You are probably not going to be censored. So we don't know how useful it is, but it's fine. Um, so, uh, Ricardo Casata gave uh, a talk in Scaling Bitcoin 2016, in which he decided basically to close down Eternity Wall. It was a cool site, working, perfect, easy, but he said, this stuff doesn't scale, it's stupid, so it's retarded. He it didn't say it that way, but, it, but that was the concept. Close it down and let's just promote open test stamps as a standard. So these two histories connect to each other because uh, sub coloring may need uh, metadata to make some Satoshi more special than others. So you may need uh, basically writing on the time chain to give more content to some, uh, to some Satoshi and vice versa. No, so if I write a, a, a ASCII Bernanke on the time chain, it's fun, but nobody care. But if I add the NFT idea that you can trade the ownership of Bernanke, whatever that means, that doesn't make any sense. But if you convince people that that makes sense, you can now have an, a, a speculative incentive to do more of this shit. 
So that was the idea. And that actually flourished for a while. You had Bitcoin NFTs. They were not called that back then. Like uh, rare papers, uh, very, very valuable. And you had the uh, Spells of Genesis, a great video game, which was, was basically still retarded because, it, because all the reasons we described. So eventually it was abandoned by Bitcoiners. And as any other retarded thing, they were picked up by shitcoiners which basically made it worse, uh, but, uh, but uh, both as art, as, a, as, a, as our scalability, as privacy, as everything. But I mean, they are more tolerant for bullshit. So uh, now there was the rediscovery. Recently there was this idea of ordinal numbers. It just takes back the original post uh, of giving one number to every Satoshi. It does nothing more, just a different notation, nothing more, the same idea, and nobody cared. So, uh, so the same inventors of the ordinals decided to add inscription which is basically metadata that you can trade as an NFT. Still the same shit, same stuff, nothing new, absolutely nothing new. There was a reason that uh, this was, uh, this was um, th that it took uh, up a little bit more. The first was that now uh, data on the, on the time chain was cheaper of 75% thanks to SegWit discount. Many people will tell you that was the same with Taproot, but that's not the case. Taproot, in the best case scenario, this is Shasek uh, uh, crunching the numbers. In the best case scenario, Taproot gives you 4.4 discount, so it's not significant. It is significant because Taproot will allow you to bypass uh, standardness control in the mempool. So you can actually do like the never give you, the never give you up uh, guy. But this is irrelevant because the very first, uh, uh, let's say, uh, big block uh, with this kind of spam was uh, they're mined in a partnership with the mining pool. So they paid the mining pool off-chain, off-band. So the standardness in the mempool uh, doesn't make any difference here. Uh, this guy, this bold guy here, you may not recognize it, but it's this guy here again. But uh, I mean, let's not get personal. I, I will get personal just a little bit because the reason that this guy made this, we can assume many reasons, we can assume motivations, but he didn't have a great year before this because he was basically shilling Luna and Terra and then got people wrecked. And so he started to shill Celsius and FTX. And so, I mean, do you want to be remembered like this or like the Taproot Wizard? So I guess I know the motivation again this one. So, since, I mean, just to, just to be complete, uh, other people started to join, not just him. Like there was uh, all the collection of anti-maximalists. Uh, you can recognize somebody like there is a, there is a like a crypto bit boy on the right and Harry Potter on the left. And uh, what, it's not, Harry Potter is a, is a wizard, right? No, I'm joking. That was, that was Nick Carter. So other people were involved unless I mean, if this was not bad enough, other people started to join. Uh, uh, when there is, like, this stuff is, is, is uh, making Bitcoin fun again. So fun people started to show up, like these guys. So great part of the uh, ordinal infrastructure, including the older the or, uh, ordinal wallet, is built by Bitcoin Satoshi's vision people, most of the infrastructure. Uh, you can just assume why, probably because they love Bitcoin and they want it to succeed, or because they just want to have fun. You know, they are, they are very funny guys, they know how to have fun. So, uh, uh, well, <laughs> you can say, okay, this is bad. They created a standard which is called BRC, which is uh, specifically and intentionally made to be inefficient. So BRC20 is even worse. It's created uh, in a way that will create the most spam possible just to troll people. But you can say, well, at least we can still prune it, right? No, not at all, because they invent uh, SRC20, which is unprunable and impossible to prune and just abuses the UTXO. Ut so now you see the motivation a little bit. So basically, you started from simple correct coin scheme and non-prunable information. You get to flexible correct coin scheme and prunable information, then to meta protocols and single hashes, then to RGB and open test stamps. Then you went back to non-prunable stuff. Basically, th this is like Nietzsche's eternal return. It's just eternal retard. It's just going in a circle. So uh, I, will, I don't have time to play David's advocate. Maybe we can do it later. Like uh, some, some, some people could say, wasn't Bitcoin, well, uh, for example, can it be spam if it follows the protocol? Well, duh, yes. Email spam does follow uh, SMTP protocol by definition, otherwise you will not receive the spam. The spam is subjective, but it's defined by the receiver, not by the sender. The spam may be valuable to the sender, otherwise it will not send you the spam. It's you that decide what is the spam to you. It's subjective, and this is clearly spam for most Bitcoin nodes. Uh, so aren't ordinals helping Bitcoin security budget? This is another retarded discussion I don't have uh, time to do. Doesn't every attack accelerate defensive development? 
Yes, everything bad accelerates your good reaction if you, if you are strong enough. So does uh, hitting your wife uh, accelerate her reflexes? Yes, still, don't do it. You're an asshole if you do. So it, it, it may create some good reaction, but you're still an asshole if you do it. Uh, I think it's clear. So what to do now? And I finish. Sorry, I'm just one minute late, but I finish. So uh, in order of increasing priority, the first thing would be to radically change Bitcoin to prevent sat coloring and data encoding. This is possible theori th theoretically, but this is not. I think it's, this is never going to happen. Bitcoin will suffer of these uh, possi possible attack surfaces and will never change so much. Because the important thing is that Bitcoin doesn't get changed under your feet. The important thing is stability, is the centralization. And change requires centraliz centralization. So another idea could be soft forking a way to remove the Witten with discount, maybe with uh, cross input signature aggregation. That doesn't change much, but at least it puts some pen penalty on the spammers, which is, I mean, maybe we will do that, maybe not. You can update the mempool filters to catch the current uh, uh, obvious pain. This is the mean, but I don't have time. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you can put like an ordinal disrespectful filter, so basically, in the mempool. Um, if you run Embassy OS, you can just flag something that will not broadcast this shit. Uh, does it help? Not really, because they can just pay the miners directly. But still, uh, if you don't want to participate to this, you have every right not to participate to this. Maybe it will also create perverse incentives. I don't care. You have the right to do whatever you want with your node. Then the thing that I would really suggest you to do is study Bitcoin and its history, call out, call out bad actors, and just tell the truth. So go beyond the 10th of September. Don't be fooled by reinvention on the same bullshit and try to study some history because it's very interesting. If you don't have time to do that, that's fine. Then just stay humble, stack sets, run nodes, and open channels because you will need them. Thank you.